Baltimore in the 14th century was then as now a unique landscape. Beautiful undoubtedly, highly sought after, but also harsh and challenging. For the people who lived and worked here, it provided particular opportunities and challenges. The environment, the elements, and the needs of man and beast were all factors that had a huge impact on the inhabitants of medieval Dartmoor. So how did our medieval forebears live, work, and die here? And what forces shaped their lives? Higher Uppercot is a fantastic example of a medieval longhouse, where people and animals live together under one roof. Although subsequently much altered, the first phase of Higher Uppercot's development dates to the early 14th century. Several centuries of a warmer climate and population growth saw the fringes of Dartmoor being gradually colonised with stone-built dwellings, often isolated, but sometimes grouped into small hamlets. But while we can still visit medieval buildings, we can no longer see the individuals and families who lived in them. This film explores what life was like for the earliest inhabitants of Higher Uppercot. People living on medieval Dartmoor probably had several occupations. As elsewhere in England, they would have produced most of their own food. Gardens such as these provided fruits as well as vegetables. Soils were poor, but corn, especially hardy grains such as rye and oats, was grown both on flatter fields and, with the help of strip lynchettes, on steeper slopes. Rye could be made into bread, and its long stems were useful for thatching. Oats were even more versatile. Fodder for livestock, pottage for humans, and even ale although the ale was said to taste like wash that pigs had wrestled in. Livestock were raised for dairy, wool, meat and traction. The cattle often being tethered in the lower part of the longhouse, known as the shippen. A channel ran down the centre of each shippen towards a hole through which the accumulated slurry would drain. There are two features about making a living on medieval Dartmoor that are particularly striking. First, each year, lowland farmers sent huge numbers of cattle, horses and sheep to spend the summer up on the moor a movement called Transhumans. The inhabitants of Higher Uppercot perhaps did the same and may also have looked after some other animals on behalf of their lowland owners. Second, a mineral called cassiterite was widely available close to the surface across many parts of Dartmoor. This could be separated, crushed and smelted into tin. Physical evidence of medieval tinning sometimes remains, such as this fantastic example of a mortar stone from a stamping mill where the cassiterite was crushed. Medieval 
Legal tax records also reveal that many tinners lived in Widdicombe, not least the area around Higher Uppercott. The lives of medieval people were shaped by a number of societal, commercial and environmental forces. Houses and hamlets each belonged to a manor. Higher Uppercott was part of the manor of Spitchwick. Houses and hamlets were also part of a parish. The inhabitants of Higher Uppercott would often have trekked five kilometres to attend the parish church at Widdicombe. The reach of commercial forces had also grown by the 13th century. The nearest weekly market and annual fair were held here at Ashburton, eight kilometres away. But in the 14th century, the lives of medieval people were ultimately shaped by two forces they had little control over. The number of corn drying kilns such as this in surviving medieval barns are an evocative reminder that the weather conditions on Dartmoor made the harvesting of crops very tough indeed. In the 1310s, torrential rainfall in three consecutive years brought terrible harvests and widespread famine. Soon afterwards, animal diseases devastated sheep flocks and cattle herds. Yet, even this crisis was overshadowed by the Black Death of 1348-49, which probably killed between 40 and 50% of the population of England. In Devon, mortality from the plague began rising on New Year's Day 1349, reaching a peak in the spring of that year. Whether through death or desertion, the Vicar of Widdicombe had to be replaced on the 16th of April, 1349. He was by no means the only one. was hit particularly badly by plague, but the story of the later Middle Ages is not one of defeat and retreat. Unlike the rest of England, population in this area grew in the 15th century. As tin mining expanded, the number of cattle coming onto the mall multiplied and the native cloth industry blossomed. While some sites were deserted, many, including higher Uppercott, continue to be occupied and may even have expanded. This gives us a surprisingly intimate glimpse of life on 15th century Dartmoor. This isolated and now hidden longhouse was destroyed by fire perhaps 50 to 100 years after the Black Death. The contents of the longhouse were frozen in time and were only discovered in the late 20th century. A long cross penny dropped in the shipping. Two wooden cups in the hall. A cooking pot sunk into the floor near the hearth. And in an inner room, further pots 
including a cistern for storing alcohol and two jugs. This extraordinary collection gives us a unique insight into the lifestyle, the wealth and material culture of the medieval people. At Higher Uppercot, we even know their names. A charter from 1418 shows Abraham Thomas granting his holdings at Uppercott, which his father and grandfather had held before him, to one William Beard. The grant included the right to gather wood for fencing and fuel, as well as gorse, heather and bracken. Uppercot is embedded in the medieval landscape of Dartmoor. In this longhouse you can be transported back in time, exploring the space that William Beard and Abraham Thomas lived in and the landscape that they and their forebears inhabited.